can you tell me what you love about dad i love dad because he's outdoorsy and he's taking me camping fishing and we've shot bows and arrows before and i got a bullseye on dartboard target and i'm really glad that he's teaching me this things those things and i'm and i love him for that that's awesome alo why do you love daddy because he's the best dad ever he lets me ride the tractor um, my dad plays with me, and, well, he's just my knight in shining armor. We love playing superheroes together. And, well, he just understands me, and he reads me the Bible at night. And thank you, dads, all around the world. Emma, why do you love daddy? Because he's a hard worker, and he's... And he's nice, he's kind, and he loves God. And he's also, whenever I'm sad and get hurt, he always gives me a great big kiss. And and he is the most special daddy we can ever have. Um, what, two things I like about Dad is that, one, he slaps my face all around. And two, every night I pretend to be dead and he tests me by tickling me and hauls me off and puts me on top of my loft bed. Hey Jaden, what makes dad so special? What makes dad so special is he's just a big inspiration to me and I, it's, he's just amazing and he's a really hard worker and I love him a lot. Cool. Hi guys, we are talking about how much I love my papa and I love him and I'm talking about Edison. So he takes me on for walks and he takes me on to a parks and I love him and he takes care of me and he tickles me and he 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 lets us go to somewhere that I can buy or not buy. Hey Brody, what would you like to tell me that you love about dad? The movies are the best popcorn. Okay, no. <laughs> Daddy's funny. Yeah. Does Daddy take you hiking, kayaking? Did he teach you how to swim? Does Daddy pray with you and and read you the Bible? Yes, yes, yes. Can you say I love you, Dad? I love you, Dad. Happy Father's Day, Daddy. Have a nice Father's Day. <laughs> Happy Father's Day. Wait, what? Hey Jacob, um, what makes dad such a great dad? Um, I love my dad because he's a hardworking man and he's loving and caring and he protects us when he needs to and he's a great dad and some other people don't have dads like that but he's one in a million dad, so. Hey, Ashland Christian Fellowship. So glad to be here with you this morning. I'm super excited to get into the Word and study and worship together and let the Spirit of God convict us and change us and work in us. But before we do that, I just want to say happy Father's Day to all of you dads out there who are doing it right, who are loving your kids, loving your wife, um, working hard to feed your family. And I know in different situations that looks differently for all of us, but we're so thankful for you. Um, I know my dad played a huge part in the man that I became and I'm looking forward to being a dad here in the next couple weeks. So happy Father's Day to you guys. And I brought this Devo that I believe is from the Lord this morning. And I'm not so excited for this Devo because it's convicting. It's been convicting my heart. And I hope that it encourages you as we jump in. But it comes from the life of Paul. And it comes from 1 Corinthians. And uh, it's Paul talking to them about, you know, how he's chosen to work and not take money and things like that. So he can really promote the gospel and see the gospel going forth. And then he says this in verse 19 of chapter 9. For though I am free from all men, I have made myself a servant to all, that I might win the more. And to the Jews I became as a Jew, that I might win Jews. To those who are under the law, as under the law, that I might win those who are under the law. To those who are without law, 
as without law, not being without law toward God, but under law toward Christ, that I might win those who are without law. To the weak I became as weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. Now this I do for the gospel's sake, that you and I, or that I may be a partaker of it with you. And this is what the Lord has been stirring on my heart from this passage. I've entitled it, Living to Win. Living to Win. Paul's whole argument is, is he's a free man. He's been set free in Christ. He really owes no one anything except to love one another, he wrote in Romans. But he chooses up front to say, though I'm free from all men, I've made myself a servant to all. Though I'm free, I'm free to do what I want to do before the Lord and have my opinions and the way that I live, but I'm choosing to subject myself and be a servant to all men instead. I'm using my freedom to serve others that I might see people get saved. And in Paul's life, people could have accused him of being inconsistent, But his consistent goal the whole time was to see people's lives turned around for Jesus. Let me explain why. Because Paul says to the Jews, I live like a Jew. I live under the law. I I keep the traditions and, you know, there's the Ten Commandments and and I go to the feasts and the celebrations and he circumcised Timothy when he took him. Even though Paul also wrote that circumcision does nothing for you as far as salvation goes. When he showed up in Jerusalem, he went to do a purification ceremony where he went through all the steps even though it did nothing for his soul because he's been saved by Jesus. Why would Paul do that? Because he wanted to see Jewish people get saved. Paul then spins it around and said, now to those without law, that's the Gentiles, to those who don't, they don't have the traditions, they don't have these things, Paul was willing to let go of his culture Let go of the way that he maybe lived among the Jews, though he never let go of what was right before God, right? He kept that law toward Christ on the inside, but that he might live among the Gentiles and embrace them for who they are and see them get saved and come to Jesus. Paul took this so far that he'd even say, to the weak I became as weak, that I might win the weak. That's totally countercultural, no matter what culture you're from. To put yourself as weak and to associate with the weak, Paul says, so that the weak would become saved as well. All that he's done, that people might get saved. And you know what? I think that is, I think that's a word for you and I. It's not comfortable doing that. It's not easy doing that. But Paul, Paul saw it as an opportunity to win people over for the Lord. Somebody said this about Paul. They said, Paul chose to be a stepping stone and not a stumbling block. And you know what? That offended people. People were offended by Paul. They were offended by his life. Jews were offended by him. And and you see Paul show up in Jerusalem before he gets captured. And the whole reason he's doing the purification ceremony is because the church is like, hey, we've heard all these rumors about you. And to prove to everyone it's not true, you need to go do this. And sometimes that's the cost of living to win souls. I want to throw this out to you. It made me think of two different things. As Paul says, I've chose to serve people in this capacity. One, it makes me think of Jesus when he washed his disciples' feet. You guys remember the story? I won't won't go there this morning. That way I don't preach forever. But he girds himself as a servant. And Jesus is the son of God. He's God. You and I are just man. But Jesus is God. And he girds himself like a servant. Which in that day, washing feet was like, you didn't do that. The servant did that. They were too, it was too low of a job for any good Jew to do. And yet Jesus girds himself and he washes the feet of his disciples. And guess what? It offended people. It offended Peter. It was offensive because they wanted Jesus to set up this kingdom and have this political power and to judge people and all these other things. And Jesus making that clear, that's not what he came to do on this time. He came to save lives. Just like Paul said, that was Jesus' motivation, to save some. And Jesus said, look, I, your Lord and teacher, I've shown you what you need to do. You need to serve one another as I've served you. And that convicts me because we like to be comfortable. I like to be comfortable. And you know what? When I think about serving people in the midst of a pandemic, I don't like it. You know, I haven't been to Costco since they stopped serving samples. 
Probably some of you guys have stopped going to Costco because you got to wear masks. I mean, I haven't gone. We don't like to be uncomfortable. We don't like to go through these things. And yet I think about Jesus in Philippians chapter 2, where it talks about the way he stepped out of his glory. He stepped out of heaven. He stepped out of his throne room where angels worshiped and adored him to come down to earth to take on a human body and live among broken, fallen people like you and me. That's the most uncomfortable thing I can imagine. And Paul would say, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. Why? That he might by all means save some. It's the heart of God. Guys, this is a challenging devotion for you and I, but I think it's timely because we're getting ready to come back together in a full service every Sunday morning. And we're so excited. I'm so excited. I've missed you guys. It's weird talking to the camera. I'm so glad it's almost done. But you know, I also know that it's gonna be challenging for you and I when we choose to social distance, when we choose to wash our hands more, when we choose to do things that make us uncomfortable. But you know what? We need to remember the purpose for which we are doing it, that we might save some. I'm telling you guys, I, I was just talking with an unbeliever recently, and just all that's gone on with COVID-19, starting to stir him up, make him think about faith, and he said, I want to go to a church. So many people, they're scared for their lives right now because of this pandemic. And I know you and I could look at that and say, there's no reason to be afraid, but you know, for them, there really is because they don't have Jesus in their boat like you and I do. We're like the disciples who are going through the storm, but Jesus is in our boat. There are going to be people coming to our church who don't have Jesus in their boat and they're going through the same storm and they're terrified. And the way that you and I handle ourselves over the next couple months as we come out of this, we need to have that heart that we're in it to win it. We're in it to see people get saved. I'm gonna pray for us. We're gonna jump into a time of worship. Father, thank you so much um, for your word. God, thank you that it speaks to us, that it convicts us. Lord, that it shapes us and sculpts us and molds us. And Lord, I pray that you would mold us more to the image of your son, Jesus. Would you be with us as we worship God wherever we are in our living rooms? Would your spirit just fall on us, God, as we watch this, stirring our hearts, God. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. God bless you guys. I love you. Hey, good morning, everyone. Why don't we just um, set some time aside to worship the Lord and give him the highest praise today. He would be glorified and lifted up. And, you know, I just had it on my heart that we would start with this chorus. It just says, we are hungry. And uh, we're just going to start with it and then go into another song. But... Let it just be our prayer today that we're hungry, we're thirsty for more of, of Jesus. We are hungry, we are hungry, we are hungry for more of you. We are thirsty, oh Jesus. We are thirsty for more of you, God. We are hungry. We are hungry. We are hungry for more of you. And we are thirsty. We are thirsty for more of you. Yeah, for more of you. That's our prayer.
God is stronger. God, you are higher than any other. Our God is healer, awesome in power. Our God, yeah, our God. God, you are greater, you're stronger, Lord, you're more powerful. Father, as your word says, you have the victory. Lord, we, we share in that victory with you, not because of what we've done, but because of your promises and what you've done for us and the covenant you've made. Lord, we just glorify you, we give you praise. Lord, we just want to sing this one more time. Our God is greater and just believe it and make it our our anthem this morning. So Lord, would you have all the praise? Just be glorified. Even as we study your word, God, be glorified. Yeah, God is great.
Amen. Amen. God bless you. Let's dive into the Word now. Good morning. Grab your Bible. Go to Revelation chapter 1 while you're finding your place there. A couple of things I wanted to say. I wanted to echo uh, Cody's comment to fathers. Uh, I'm grateful for my dad. I made some mistakes, but he loved Jesus and wanted to have uh, wish a happy Father's Day to all you guys. Wish we could be together. And I encourage all the families that are listening to me right now, spoil your dad. Yeah, spoil your dad, especially if your last name begins with Anderson. All right, spoil your dad. All right, do that. Also wanted to remind you that next Sunday, June 28th, we'll be meeting two services outside at 9 o'clock and 11 o'clock. We're going to do our best to have the place ready as we can, uh, encouraging families to sit together. And maybe if you're part of a small group, a tiny little church or something, you guys can sit together. Uh, but out of respect for those who take this quite seriously, and I know some of you don't, but for those who do, um, we're going to honor them, as we heard in Cody's devotion this morning, uh, by deferring to them, even if they're the weak, even if they're the misled, we're, <laughs> we're going to defer uh, and love one another in that way by uh, showing respect, s- social distancing, and encouraging you to do the same. And besides, it's going to help us to really uh, learn how to connect without the, you know, some of the uh, things we've relied on in the past. So hope to see you next Sunday at 9 or 11 outside bring your lawn chair bring your blanket and uh, come prepared to meet the lord together my heart's hungry to worship with you and encourage you to be a part of what we're doing last sunday uh, we started the book of the revelation it's continuing in our series ready or not i believe it's so timely in light of what's going on in our world today regardless of your view of the last day prophecies in the scriptures you can't argue that these are unprecedented days was talking to a pastor friend the other day on the phone and talking about some of the decisions we've had to make that we've never had to make before. You know, wearing masks, not wearing masks, social distancing, not social distancing. You know, how do you do all that? And he said something very profound to me. He said, you know, at least this has never happened before. And so no one can look at us and say, well, you know, when I was a kid and we had a pandemic and this is how we did church, uh, we're all making mistakes and we're all stumbling our way through this. But I can tell you this from my heart, that we're doing our very best, and I know you are too uh, in the situation that you're in. So take your Bible, go with me to Revelation chapter 1. I want to read the first verse, and then just pause. We'll read the rest of it in just a moment. But look what it says, and Cody mentioned this to us last week. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants things which must shortly take place. And he sent and signified it by his angel to his servant John. There's so much in that little verse. Uh, tells us that Jesus is both the subject and the source of everything that we're going to read in here. It's all about him. When we get distracted by the images, let's go back to the fact of what we know. We know it's about Jesus, and it's related to Jesus, and coming from Jesus is designed to give us a greater appreciation of Jesus, to put him right in the center where he belongs. As we'll read a little bit later in the chapter, we see Jesus standing right in the middle uh, of this seven torches or lights or whatever and he seven stars and he's right in the middle and that's where we want jesus to be in the center where he belongs so let's go ahead and read the rest of the chapter um he john continues in saying this in verse two john bore witness to the world word of god and testimony of jesus christ to all the things that he saw blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written in it for the time is near. John, to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and was and who is to come and from the seven spirits who are before his throne and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, the ruler over the kings of the earth, to him who loved us, I love this part, to him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood, and has made us kings and priests to his God and Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Don't you just want to say amen to that? He goes on in verse 7, says, Behold, he is coming with clouds, and every eye will see him, even they who pierced him. I'll be talking about that in just a moment. They who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him. Even so... Amen. 
I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. I, John, both your brother and companion in the tribulation and kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was on the island that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a voice as of a trumpet saying, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, and what you see write in a book and send it to the seven churches which are in Asia, to Ephesus, to Smyrna, to Pergamos, to Thyatira, to Sardis, to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. And then I turned to see the voice that spoke with me, and having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the midst of the seven lampstands, one like the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the feet and girded about the chest with a golden band. His head and hair were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes like a flame of fire. His feet were like fine brass, as if refined in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. He had in his right hand seven stars, out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was like the sun shining in its strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. But he laid his hand on me, saying, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am he who lives and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of Hades and of death. Write the things which you've seen and the things which are and the things which will take place after this. The mystery of the seven stars which you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven lampstands which you saw are the seven churches. Powerful yet mysterious inviting us in to pursue in the Spirit the things of the Lord. Let's pray together. Lord, help us today as we read and study and think about who you are, what you want to do, how you're using things in our lives to get our attention, how situations that might disappoint are actually steering us towards our own Patmos experience, our own opportunity to turn and see you and hear you and know you, and get the instruction from you for the rest of our lives, however long and whatever direction that may take. Would you speak? Would you penetrate past our defenses and minister to us in Jesus' name? Amen. Powerful, powerful section. And part of it really struck me as I had prepared this sermon and had all my notes written out. And then I got up um, Saturday morning uh, when this is recorded, and I did my devotions, and I happened upon in the streams in the desert, which I read every single morning, the reference today was out of Isaiah 30, where uh, Isaiah talks about a day that's coming in the future, when God says, and though the Lord gives you the bread of adversity and the water of affliction, yet your teachers will not be moved into a corner anymore, but your eyes shall see your teachers, and listen, and your ears shall hear a word behind you saying, this is the way, walk in it whenever you turn to the right hand or whenever you turn to the left. And I had felt like the Lord wanted me to talk to us today about a voice behind us a voice behind us. You see, if you take John's situation and the setting and where he was when all this took place, it sort of helps us to kind of make it more relevant. If you think about the fact that physically he was withdrawn from everybody he knew and loved, placed on an island, he was put there not by his own choice, by, by the choices of others. Uh, we understand that it was 10 miles long, 6 miles wide, very desolate, place had some caves that they could sleep in but it was used by the Roman government as a banishment place a place of punishment well it wasn't something that John chose for himself 
it happened as a consequence, he tells us, because of the testimony of Jesus Christ, evidently because he had been witnessing or sharing or ministering. What's interesting to me is I discovered this week in my study that from the Isle of Patmos you could see the city of Ephesus, which tradition tells us was the place that John had ministered to as a pastor, as a shepherd, as one of the elders there. And he could see it as he was separated from it, unable to reach to it, he could see it, only to be tormented by the fact that he wasn't able to be where he wanted to be. So for John, you see, this place was for him a, a place of abandonment and isolation. He, he didn't choose to be alone, but he was alone. He didn't choose to, to be rejected, but he was rejected. It was a place, probably, if, if you put yourself in his shoes, a place of hopelessness where he was just waiting um, until somebody somewhere either came to get him or he died. You know, it wasn't, it wasn't a very nice place. But there's interesting, as John tells us about this particular encounter that he had with Jesus, he says he was in the Spirit on the Lord's Day. In the Spirit on the Lord's Day. Now, I've always joked about that, that that's a good thing to be on the Lord's Day, is in the Spirit. But if you think about it, for John, man, he had every reason not to be in the Spirit. And nobody was watching. He wasn't in the Spirit because everyone else was or because he had to. Um, he was in the Spirit. It means to be controlled by and under the influence of the Holy Spirit. And it's called the Lord's Day. Uh, we know from other passages in the in New Testament that that's a reference to Sunday, the day of the Lord's resurrection. Now, there are some scholars, and I've read some of their commentaries, who believe that because of the nature of the apocalyptic nature of the book of the Revelation, that really this is a reference to the day of the Lord. Um, we talked about that a few weeks ago, how that the Old Testament prophets talked about the, the judgment of the wicked and the reward of the righteous as being altogether the day of the Lord. But this is not the day of the Lord. This is the Lord's day. Uh, listen to J. Vernon McGee, how he kind of humorously helps us to see this. He said, the Lord's day and the day of the Lord are two different things. We recognize that anti-fat and fat anti are two different things and that a chestnut horse and a horse chestnut are two different things and I would say he continues that the day of the Lord and the Lord's day are two different things also and that the Lord's day refers to what we call Sunday so I found that humorous I don't know I passed that on the idea of a horse chestnut and a chestnut horse um, the Lord's day he was in the spirit on the Lord's day now let me just pause for a moment I don't know where you are when you're watching this and I don't know what day it is whether you're watching it on Sunday or another day of the week whether you're alone or with someone else. But I would ask you the question, are you in the Spirit? Are you under the control of? Are you under the influence of? Is the Holy Spirit able to direct both your thoughts and the impulses of your heart? If not, why not? What is keeping you from encountering and surrendering to and being under the influence of the Holy Spirit? You remember what Paul told the Ephesians in Ephesians 5. He said, don't be drunk with wine. That leads to excess. But be filled. And the Greek tense is continually be, being filled. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. We know what it's like, many of us, to be under the influence of some substance. But now he's saying, what would it be like to be under the influence of the Holy Spirit. So here's John on the Lord's Day dealing with his emotional abandonment and all the situation that he didn't like and the Spirit of God surprised him with a visit from Jesus. He says, as I was in the Spirit on the Lord's Day, I heard a voice behind me. Now, I... I don't want to get off, nor do I want to chase many rabbits. At least if we do chase them, let's try to catch them. But I want to talk to us as a church on this whole idea of hearing a voice behind us. You see, I'm convinced that God uses our circumstances as a specific and personalized curriculum for our character development. He allows us to end up in places like Patmos, places we didn't choose, circumstances we don't like, in order to prepare us for a voice 
behind us. Remember Isaiah said, when you turn to the right hand or you turn to the left, and the context seems to indicate that those are bad decisions, when you make a turn to the right or when you make a turn to the left that's not really where God wanted you to go, God promised to his people that he would have a voice from behind us saying, this is the way. This is the way. No, not that way. Not that way. This is the way. Walk in it. That's so critical that we understand that God is seeking to do something in his church. Listen, please. So that he can do something through his church. If we aren't spirit empowered, which requires us to be under the influence and listening to and obedient to, to the Holy Spirit, then we're only doing what we can do in the energy of our own flesh. And I'll tell you this, if you do what you can do, you're going to get only what you can do. But when we do what only God can do, when we submit and surrender as ordinary people to His extraordinary power, man, just imagine what God can do when He decides and finds a group of people who have finally said, all right, Lord, I want your kingdom to come. I want your will to be done in my life as it's being done in heaven. I'm, so in order to help that, Lord, I'm going to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and seek to be to where I can hear the promptings of the Holy Spirit. Sometime back, I pulled a copy of the Vertical Church off the shelf. I'd read it several times before. And James McDonald's asked this very pointed question to pastors and to Christian leaders. He said, would you go to Burger King if they didn't have burgers and fries? How long would you sit in the theater if the screen didn't light up? Do you line up for gas where the station's fuel tanks are empty? Eventually, everyone vacates church where God is not obviously present and working. Getting people back to church is pointless unless God comes back first. Oh, made me stop and think. Made me stop and pray. Made me say, Lord, that voice that you promised, I want to hear. I want to listen. I want to lean in. Like John, I want to turn to see the voice that is speaking to me. So when John turned on the Lord's day, what did he see? What did he see? Remember, he tells us very clearly that when he turned to see, he heard and saw in the midst of the seven lampstands one like the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the feet. Now the voice had said to him before he turned around, saying, I'm the Alpha and the Omega. That's powerful. I think what John saw immediately after he turned around, we might be able to say, uh, summarize as he saw Jesus as the almighty, awesome one. First, he s here's the description that Jesus is the alpha and the omega, the first letter of the Hebrew, uh, Greek alphabet, the last letter of the Greek alphabet. I read a story uh, from A.J. Gordon commentary about a man named Rabinowitz. He was a Jewish rabbi from Russia uh, that he met at the Chicago Exhibition in 1893. Now, Rabinowitz was a Russian Jew, and he said to uh, A.J. Gordon, Do you know what questionings and controversies the Jews have kept up over Zechariah 12.10? That's the reference to him who they pierced. Let me read it to you. They shall look upon me, me, which is the Hebrew, two-letter word, the Aleph and the Tev in the Hebrew, first and last of the Hebrew, whom they have pierced, and they will not admit, this Rabinowitz says, that it's Jehovah whom they pierced. So they argue over, who is this me? Well, Rabinowitz goes on to say, um, do you notice this word me is simply the first and last letters of the Hebrew alphabet? And he says, imagine my surprise when I turned and opened Revelation 1, 7, and 8 and read these words, in Zechariah, quoted by John, Jesus seemed to say to me, do you doubt who it is that you pierced? I am Jesus, the Aleph Tav, or the Alpha and the Omega. Man, it made a huge difference in Rabinowitz's life. And I think it would make a big difference in ours if we begin to understand that Jesus is saying, before anything began, I was there, and when everything ends, I'll be there. I am the Alpha and Omega because I sit suspended over both. 
amazing concept. But he also later turns and sees this description of Jesus that almost is directly a quote out of Daniel chapter 7. When he sees what Daniel described as the ancient of days. Let me read it to you from Daniel 7. And then we'll go back and compare it to verses 14 and 15. But look at this. In Daniel 7 verse 9 it says, I beheld till thrones were cast down, and the ancient of days did sit, whose garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head like pure wool. His throne was like a fiery flame, and his wheels as burning fire. You see the comparison? Look at what it says here. It says in verse 14, that, or verse 13, that he was clothed with a garment down to the feet, girded about with a golden band, and his head and his hair were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes as a flaming fire, and his feet, or his wheels, were like fine brass, as if refined in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. What is John seeing? Well, he's seeing what the Old Testament described as the ancient of days, Jesus and God, simultaneously listed as one and the same. Jesus became to John that day more than just a, a friend that he grew, saw and ministered to, more than, than someone he saw die on a cross and later rise up in, in the clouds to heaven. And, and believe it or not, even though those were spectacular images that John had, and he had no doubt been telling people his whole life about Jesus and had written four books by the time that he penned this one, still for John, there was a part of Jesus that he'd never seen before. See him as the eternal one. Saw him as the ancient of days. The alive, almighty, awesome one that Jesus is. You know, I think sometimes we get just a little too chummy with Jesus. I remember reading about one guy who says that every morning Jesus would come and put his arm around him while he was shaving. And the guy whose book I was reading says, we know it wasn't Jesus because the man kept shaving. I think we, we sometimes have reduced Jesus, a humble Jesus, meek and mild. But when you see the story of who Jesus is in his glory, man, it just, it just astounds us. It blows our mind, and it should humble us. He saw Jesus. Well, what was Jesus doing? It, it says he saw him standing in the midst of, of seven lampstands or seven candlesticks which we know in verse 20 Jesus himself tells us are the seven churches Jesus hear me is in the church and when we read the letters to the seven churches in in, in a few weeks what you're going to understand is that Jesus is into imperfect churches he loves church he likes church he wants to be in the middle of his church and Jesus is standing there in the middle and he's communicating to John and to his churches he's saying hey I got a message I want you to write this down John and send it to the messengers of those churches he was not just using simile and metaphor he's literally saying listen this is something grand and glorious and powerful and personal and a message that I have for my church so let me stop again ACF whether you're in leadership or just coming or whether you're just getting uh, to know us through the internet and through various means of, of the broadcast that we have. Who is Jesus to us? Is he just a figurehead? Is he just an excuse for us to do what we've been doing in our church social club setting? Or is he in fact this glorious, grand, eternal, awesome God who is into his church, who has a right to declare to his church what is right, what is wrong, where they need to turn, where they need to change, what they need to keep, what they need to, to let go of? Man, Jesus is into his church. And he wants us to turn to see him. What is it that you need to turn away from in order that you might more fully see Jesus. It's a sobering thought, one that I hope you'll spend some time thinking about and, and applying to your own heart. I know that's how God's working with me is. When that voice speaks and when I turn, what am I turning away from? In order to focus more 
fully and more completely upon Jesus Christ. He is communicating. Uh, it's a spectacular, sobering vision. Uh, it, it's, it's an amazing vision. And it, you know, it, in a way, it was scary to John because we know in verse 17 that he fell at his feet as dead. And I think that's appropriate, as Cody kind of mentioned last week, that when we truly understand who Jesus is, is, it's a very humbling experience. And until you see him that way, um, y- you maybe have an elevated opinion of yourself. I, I know uh, C.S. Lewis uh, kind of comically and sometimes powerfully put in his uh, little book, uh, Mere Christianity, he says, the point is God wants you to know him. God wants to give himself to you. And God and you are two things of such kind that if you really get in touch with him at all, you will, in fact, be humble, delightedly humble, feeling the infinite relief of having once for all got rid of the silly nonsense about your own dignity, which has made you restless and unhappy your whole life. God's trying to make you humble in order to make that moment possible trying to get you to take off the silly, ugly, fancy dress in which we've got ourselves all worked up in. Isn't that silly? But he's right. God is creating a specific curriculum both to detach us from the things of the world and to reattach us to the things of the Spirit. So as John falls on his face, this Jesus... This glorious, grand, powerful Jesus reaches down and touches John and reassures him and comforts him and strengthens him. Uh, he's, he's ministering to John in John's weakness. John did the right thing, but so did Jesus in taking John as John was and doing for John what John needed. Listen, I hope you're hearing the application that my heart is feeling. That when I get real with God and honest with myself, the only reaction that's really appropriate is to say, God, I'm not. God, I can't. God, whoa, I'm, woe is me, like Isaiah and Isaiah 6. I, I, six I'm undone. I, I have nothing to offer you, God. But not to stop there, but to understand that God knows fully who you are and who you're not and what you can and what you cannot do. But the good news is that He loves you as you are. He loves you where you are. And He wants to touch you in the condition you are and to give you strength to stand up and to move out in obedience to whatever purpose and calling He has for your life. It's a powerful and personal experience. So when John heard the voice, he turns, he sees this awesome Jesus, the Alpha and Omega, the Ancient of Days, but he also saw Jesus as, from his own declaration as the alive and available one. He repeats again, I'm the Alpha and Omega. And then he goes on to say, I'm the one who was, is and was and is to come, but I'm also the one who was dead and I'm alive and I've got the keys of death and hell. What an amazing God we have. Death could not hold Jesus. The grave wasn't powerful enough. The devil might have thought he won a momentary victory, but the Bible tells us both in prophecy and in reality that Jesus smashed the head of Satan through the cross, and he rose victorious three days later, and on his way out of the grave, he snatched the keys from the old devil. Listen, the devil's got nothing on me. The devil can't hold me down. I love there's a song going around now uh, that, you know, the devil can't hold me back. Oh, no, no, no devil going to hold me back. Darkness invaded Jesus. But in the process, Jesus invaded the darkness. In these days, dark, confusing, nobody knows the future. Our society's torn apart with social injustice and the reactions to that. And there are conspiracy theories on both right and left about who's in charge and who's doing what. And we've got this whole spirit of, of you know, polarizing that I've mentioned before that's going on to more than ever before in my life. But in that very time, Jesus is alive and he's available 
by his Holy Spirit in each of our lives to minister to us as we are where we are. I always like to say, God loves you as you are, but he loves you too much to leave you as you are. He wants to work in your life. He wants to bring you to a point of intimacy with him, of true connection with him. You know, sometimes I think people look at Christians as if we're only learning, turn into the Lord because we're weak. And while I admit I'm weak, that's not the reason. In fact, some of the smartest people who have ever lived became Christians. You've heard of Pascal? Um, and, and some people look at uh, people like uh, I mean, faith of having really no brains at all. But Pascal, if you know anything about him, um, he was one that came up with calculating machines. We're talking back in 1600s. Um, he, he talked about probability and the decision theory as well as mathematics, of risk management. He proved the existence of the vacuum, which set the stage for quantum physics. His statistical probability analysis envisioned the insurance industry, managed science, racing forms, lotteries, and Las Vegas. Pascal invented the vacuum pump and detailed our understanding of outer space. His thoughts stand behind the jet engine, internal combustion motors, the atomic bomb, and mass media. Pascal was a genius. But listen, I wanted to talk to you about his faith. Pascal learned, as many of us have learned, about the personal, powerful presence of Jesus. Pascal had a note pinned inside of his coat when he died, and he had written inside that little note, the year of grace, 1654, Monday, 23rd November, from about half past 10 at night until about half past midnight. Fire! God of Abraham, God of Isaac, God of Jacob, not the God of the philosophers and of the learned, certitude, feeling, joy, peace, God of Jesus Christ, my God and your God, forgetfulness of the world and everything except God. He can only be found by the ways taught in the gospel, grandeur of the human soul, righteous Father, the world has not known you, but I have known you. Joy, 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 tears of joy, Pascal wrote in his note. Let me not be separated from you forever. May I never forget his words. Listen, Jesus is very, very real. He's very much alive, and he wants to be real to you and to me. What hinders us so many times is the multitude of distractions and pettiness of our lives and the, the ways we get to looking at others and saying, they're the real problem. No, they're the real problem. If only you hadn't done what you did, I wouldn't have done what I'd done. And, and the whole you know, tit-for-tat thing that just goes on back and forth in our culture. Listen, those things serve as, as barriers to the simple connection of a created soul to a creative God. God wants to go beyond all of that stuff. Can you hear him? Can you hear him in the emptiness of your own heart? In the dryness of your spirit? Maybe in the tightness of your jaw? and the anger that's given you ulcers? Maybe when you're so tired of watching the news talk about one more conspiracy theory about this person or that person that's trying to destroy the world. Listen just a little bit more. I bet you hear a voice behind you. The Spirit of God. Will you turn? Will you turn? Will you right now turn towards Jesus Christ who loved you, gave himself for you, He wants to wash you in His blood. He wants to make you a part of His family. He wants to reveal Himself personally to you and to me. And He has the divine right as our creator and sustainer to do that very thing. Isn't it time? Isn't it about time that we start listening? Do you know in the next few chapters we're going to hear this phrase over and over and over again from Jesus Himself in the red letters, He who has ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Can you hear? Do you have ears to hear? And will you use those ears to listen to what Jesus is saying to you personally, to you as a 
member of your family, leader in your community? What exactly does God have in mind for you? What is the point of your pointless life? What is God stirring you, preparing you to hear, to understand about himself and then about you and about your world? I believe God is doing some unique things in an unprecedented way. One of the things I always used to like to say about God is that he is incredibly faithful, but never predictable. Have you noticed? He's at work. He's moving in my heart, not in ways I would have expected, but in powerful, personal ways. He's working in our church, again, not in ways I would have expected or anticipated or welcomed but he's doing it. He's pruning. He's bringing. People are getting saved. Lives are being changed. And we can't take any credit for it. It's all God doing this amazing work. I wonder what God is trying to say to you this morning. Are you listening? Will you turn to him? I'm going to pray. Then I'm going to encourage you if you're part of a house church. In fact, I'm going to double dog dare you to uh, go a little deeper. And ask yourself and answer with one another, how is God using your circumstances to get you to listen to his spirit? Maybe the symbolism of being on an island like Patmos might help trigger you circumstances that you don't like that maybe for you are the preparation to something grand and glorious. Second question, what is it that you might need to turn away from in order to see what God wants you to see? John had to turn in order to really get a good glimpse of Jesus. What is it that you need to turn away from in order to turn to Jesus? Maybe it's your religious background. Maybe it's your own self-worth or self-image or something that's around you. Whatever it is, listen, turn away. And then the third question is, what might be keeping you from being in the Spirit, under the control of, in the place of being able to be responsive to God's Holy Spirit. Lord, thank you for the chance to be the teacher for this subject today. What an incredible privilege to see it, to understand it. Someone said, if you want to learn something, teach it. And I know how you have used this in my own heart to cause me to ask those uncomfortable questions about my uncomfortable circumstances and how you might be using those to try to prepare me for a voice, a word, a revelation, a movement, a powerful transactional encounter with Jesus Christ. Lord, what are you doing in the lives of your people, wherever they are? Some of them lost their jobs. Some of them have uncertain future related to financial matters. Some have been disturbed and and polarized and caught up in this whole thing of injustice. and There's just so much uncertainty, God. What are you trying to do? How can you turn what the enemy has meant for evil into something good? Would you speak to us? Would you connect us one with another as we seek to love and pray for and support one another? Father, we look forward to next Sunday when we get to gather again with the family of God. But we want to see you more than we want to see each other. Reveal yourself, Jesus, to your kids, and then use us to be adequate representatives of you in this crazy world that we live in. God, I love you, and I thank you for loving me, and I thank you for the season of life that I get to serve in, and I know that you have great plans for your church. Thank you for being our Savior and our God. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. So I encourage you. Those questions are on our app. If you didn't get them written down, you can go simply to our ACF web, and at the bottom there's the notes that you can look on there. Those questions are there. God bless. Look forward to seeing you next Sunday.